So good evening. Uh, I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and it's a great opportunity for uh, all of us to uh, spend an evening with the director of CAA, John Brennan. Uh, I also want to welcome many members of the Belfer Center International Council who are here, including Bob and Renee Belfer, who, uh, for whom the Belfer Center is uh, named. So thank you guys for coming, and thanks so many other members of the International Council. So uh, the idea that uh, somebody who has the job that the director of CIA has would spend a day here with us at Harvard with whatever else is going on in the world is uh, odd, I would say, and uh, is a wonderful uh, compliment uh, uh, and, and actually an honor, I would say, to us uh, that you've given us this much of your time, uh, given the tasks that you've got in your, uh, in your inbox, your to-do your to -do list, your agenda. I don't envy it, but in any case, uh, the director's been with us today since lunch uh, with a string of uh, different meetings from the intelligence fellows and the national security fellows, some other students, uh, some faculty for brainstorming. We've been having a great time. I've been learning a lot, so I, I thank him. Uh, the director is a, a great example of what we hope uh, uh, Kennedy School students might uh, grow up to become. Hmm? So. Uh, for those of you studying political science or government, uh, uh, John graduated from Fordham and then from the University of Texas in political science and government with a master's in government. He uh, signed up at CIA in uh, 1980. Uh, he rose through a whole series of assignments, all with great distinction. Uh, indeed, after 9-11, he was the person assigned to create what is today the Counterterrorism Center. Uh, he then retired from CIA. He got involved with uh, President Obama uh, when he was a candidate. Uh, he was appointed the special assistant to the president at the White House for special assistant for counterterrorism and homeland security in January of 2009, where he was part of the three or four person inner circle, as Tom Donlan has described, uh, that would meet with the president every day. And that actually came to be a very important uh, decision-making context. And then in uh, two years ago, he was asked to become director of CIA. So uh, a fantastic career and something from which I think everybody here can learn a lot. If you look at the agenda of things that he deals with, they're everything. Mm -hmm. So he's got to wake up in the morning or even wake up in the middle of the night thinking, the president might ask, is there any chance Iran has a secret nuclear path that we haven't discovered? Or what is Putin up to in Ukraine or the Baltics? Or what about these ISIL guys? Uh, are they getting more of them or fewer of them? Or, and in any case, what do they have to do with this other crowd called Kuristan? And then are they different from al-Nusra? And how many? Uh, and then you go on and on and on. I mean, this is an endless list. So I don't envy him his job. And as I say again, I'm extremely grateful that he's taken this much time out of his schedule to be here with us. So John, I just want to say thank you very much for your service. So the format for tonight uh, is uh, Q and A's. John said he didn't want to give a speech. Uh, he would be happy to try to answer any questions or address them. Uh, it's obviously an unclassified conversation, so there'll be some topics that won't be fully explored. But uh, uh, and I'm going to uh, ask questions for about a half hour, uh, trying to pick questions that I think would be of great general interest. Even though I have my list of 99 questions that I'd like to pursue as well, but I'm not doing those tonight. And uh, then we go to open mic. There are two microphones here on the ground floor and two microphones on the loge. All questions are in order, but no speeches other than the conversation here on the, on the, uh, on the podium. So John, think about, uh, 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 actually a student asked me to ask you this question. He said, uh, suppose I'm a freshman at Harvard, or suppose I'm just graduating from the Kennedy School, and I'm trying to think, what about a career in intelligence? Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? Uh, 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 
and if, if, if it's a good idea, if you would recommend this to this young lady, uh, uh, put her a clue or two about, uh, about how, how one succeeds in this business. Well, I certainly make news if I said it's a bad idea, wouldn't I? I started off here. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you, Graham, for inviting me here. I find it always very intellectually stimulating to First of all, get out of the Beltway environment uh, where we are all hostages to our inbox and all the issues that we have to deal with. So it's great to come up here and be able to interact in this forum as well as with the sessions that I had during the day today. I do, will say I really believe I have the best job in the world, bar none, for a variety of reasons that gets to your question. One is that I get to work every day with some of the brightest, most dedicated, patriotic Americans who really are dedicated to trying to help keep their fellow Americans safe and secure. It is a wonderful, wonderful environment. And every month when I swear in new officers in CIA's lobby in front of our memorial wall, uh, I just feel so invigorated by the fact that there are a constant stream of Americans who want to join the CIA, want to be part of this intelligence mission at a time that's critically important to our nation's security. Because in my 35 or so years of working on national security matters, I've never seen a time when there's been such a an array of complex, challenging, and serious threats to our national security as a result of world developments as well as technology. And so I have an opportunity to be a part of this effort along with these great men and women of CIA as well as the rest of the intelligence community. And also it's a, it's a place where I worked for 25 years, starting out as a GS9 young officer back in 1980 never imagining in my wildest dreams that I would one day be in the CIA director's chair. Uh, and it's just, it's surreal many, many days. And I, I tell the story that I used to be George Tennant's chief of staff, and I would be going in and out of his office all the time. And so I think about the director's office as George's office. And I had this recurring nightmare that I'm in my office and George comes in and yells, get your stuff the hell out of my office. <laughs> because it just seems so unusual for me to be in the director's seat. But it really is quite a, uh, a remarkable uh, adventure that I've been on. And working with people like Mike Morell, who's here, my former deputy, uh, just having that type of uh, environment where there are people who of such caliber, expertise, talent, and dedication, it's, uh, it's something that stimulates me every day. I look forward to going to work. So you would say go for it? I'd say go for it, absolutely, and gain as much experience uh, and skill uh, as you can as you prepare. Uh, and I know that sometimes the process takes a while to come into CIA and the intelligence community because we really want to understand not just somebody's credentials, because there are a lot of people who have very impressive resumes. We want to know about the person because we're going to be entrusting these people with some of this country's most sensitive secrets and uh, issues. And so we want to make sure that they're somebody that we want to have in the organization for a career. So uh, tonight's uh, event is on the record and covered by the press. And uh, so let me start with, uh, uh, since the, the news folks can't wait for very long without news, uh, Iran, uh, the Iranian, Iranian nuclear accord. Let's talk about that just for a second. So uh, if I look at the history the CIA's recent record of picking up and discovering uh, secret nuclear facilities is not perfect. So uh, if I take Ferdo in Iran, uh, that seems to have been discovered by our allies. If I take the North Korean highly enriched uranium line, that was discovered by our colleague Sieg Hecker when they showed it to him, and we didn't seem to know about it. Uh, if I look at the, uh, at the Syrian reactor that they were building, when the Israelis discovered it, I remember Mike Hayden telling me, whoa, he thought maybe they were, you know, was a, it surprised him. Uh, so uh, in this case, the, the deal, the, the accord, constrains only things that we know about, because you can only constrain things that we know about. But what about an unknown facility? And let me be specific and say, in the, in the agreement, uh, what specifics are, they, are there that would give us better ability to detect the Iranians if they were building a covert facility? And the second question would be, if the deal falls apart, what, uh, what damage will that do to your ability to make judgments about that? Well, I think we've gone to school over the past number of years on the Iranian nuclear program. And I must say, the 
JPOA, these Joint Plan of Action negotiations that resulted in this framework agreement, really have been some of the most intensive, deliberate efforts that I've seen in my 35 years in government. There really has been an effort to try to look at all the different pathways that Iran could have to a nuclear weapon. And so not only did it reduce the number of centrifuges that it has in operating, uh, as well as cutting off the pathways, not just to uranium enrichment, but also to plutonium enrichment. It also has a very intrusive inspection regime, and it uh, requires that the Iranians um, allow the IEA and others to have the opportunity to look at some of the things that are upstream. For example, their uranium mining activities, their centrifuge production, even the production of some of the centrifuge parts. And so what it tries to do is, and there's no way that this um, agreement is based on trust. It looks at all the different pathways, all the different opportunities that the Iranians might have to cheat on this deal. And might there be a covert facility at some point? Well, they could try to set something up. But the centrifuges that are being decommissioned are coming under the monitoring and uh, control of uh, the IEA. Uh, and the various um, feeder material going into such a facility will also be monitored. We are going to be uh, looking at this very carefully, along with our partners. Uh, and so I think this has really tried to look at all the different aspects of it, not just current, but also what we need to be uh, aware of going, going forward. And over the course of many years, the, I think the agency and the intelligence community have uncovered a lot of secret facilities and yes. secret activities. You give examples of some that may have been brought to our attention or working with partners, and this deal is an international agreement that has the P5 plus 1, UN Security Council, IEA, and so this is not just going to be relying solely on the United States or intelligence community. It's going to have, I think, uh, a fairly wide um, array of eyes and ears looking and listening into what Iran is doing. So let me just do one, one, one more follow-up on it. So if we just compare two worlds, one the world in which this accord, which still has got to be translated into a, a detailed binding agreement, mm -hmm. is implemented. So now we're in that world. And your opportunities to discover uh, Iran's effort to build a covert facility, and to whatever extent you're likely to discover it, that will deter them from pursuing it. So that's world one. And world two, this deal comes apart in some way. It never, never consummates. And so you're back to wherever you were before we were negotiating the additional elements of transparency or inspections or upstream. So how much difference does that make in terms of your ability to say to the president or say to American people, we have a reasonable level of confidence that there's not another path to a bomb that Iran is pursuing? Well, a lot of it I think is gonna be very fact and condition dependent, uh, but either way we go, Iran has um, a track record of causing trouble in the region outside of the nuclear program. We have a great obligation, CIA and the intelligence community, to carefully watch what the Iranians are doing, not just on the domestic and nuclear front, mi missile front and other fronts, but also what they're doing throughout the region. And so we need to be able to tell the president of what we know and what we don't know. And it's, it's impossible to say what it is that you don't know. But what we can do is be as rigorous as possible in saying we've looked at it from this angle, we've looked at it here, we were working with our partners, uh, and identify those indicators as best we can that would indicate that Iran is going down a certain path. And that's one of the obligations of the intelligence community, is not just discover things, but look at those things that lead to it. And so that's part of this deal, which is looking upstream to be able to prevent them from moving forward with the materiel and the wherewithal that's required in order to have a covert facility. So I see CIA's job going forward here as being as uh, significant, important, and as challenging as it has been in the past because we need to not just watch what Iran is doing on all these various fronts, but there's also a lot of, the world's a big place I've come to find out, and we have a lot of things that we need to do. So let me ask just one more about this because we were chatting earlier. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay, it's still, you can hear me? Okay, don't worry. The, the, we were chat, chat, earlier today we were chat, chatting about uh, the Israeli position on this and you interact all the time with your Israeli intelligence 
uh, you know, counterparts, but also the prime minister and his views about whether this is, uh, makes us safer or alternatively is a more dangerous world, assuming this accord is consummated. So uh, if I think Iran lies, steals, and cheats as a nature, as, as part of their nature, you could argue that I'm more in favor of this deal because I get more visibility into Iran and therefore they're more constrained with, their, with respect to what they're doing. So that would be one side of the argument. The other side of the argument would be to say, no, uh, look at the negative. So how, how, how do you assess this when you're, when you're talking to your you know, Israeli intelligence and professional counterparts? Well, when I talk to people about it, I'm not going to yeah, narrow it down on one, one group of folks. Uh, I look at what the Iranians were doing before this, these negotiations got underway in terms of their enrichment capability, number of centrifuges they had operating, how much physical material they were acquiring, the stockpiling, uh, what they were doing on the plutonium front, all those things that were then halted while these negotiations went on. Now I look at where they're going to be limited going in the future. And I must tell you, the individuals who, who say that this deal provides a pathway for Iran to a bomb are being wholly disingenuous, in my view, if they know the facts, if they understand what's required for a program. Because if you look at all the various aspects of this, what it has done preventing Iran, limiting Iran for 15, 20 years in a variety of ways, I think I certainly am uh, pleasantly surprised that the Iranians have agreed to so much here in terms of the inspection regime, the reduction as far as the centrifuges, the stockpile, uh, what they're doing with the Iraq uh, reactor, all of that I think is really quite surprising and quite good. Now, the people who point to this deal as saying it is insufficient and it's a pathway to a bomb, I think what they really are saying is that, okay, the deal might be okay, but we're very concerned with the sanctions relief that this is going to give Iran the wherewithal, the money, the capability to cause more trouble throughout the area. And so I think they're using this deal as a way to say, no, we don't want that relief of sanctions because of the funding streams that may flow from it. Now, I think that's a legitimate issue, concern, and argument. But that's why I say what they shouldn't be doing is really trying to pull apart this deal from a nuclear program perspective because I think that's as solid as you're going to get. And as others have said, you're not going to get the Iranians to just totally dismantle everything and say, okay, we're not going to pursue any type of nuclear capability from a peaceful perspective. Uh, so I think it has really minimized what they have. But I think the concern of regional states, Israelis, Gulf Arabs, and others, as well as others, to include the United States, is that we have to stay on top of the Iranians because they do have this record of sponsoring different insurgencies. They're a state sponsor of terrorism and we cannot relax the pressure on them on those fronts. Might this deal lead to some greater moderation of their policies? I think President Rouhani and uh, other elements within the Iranian government have shown much greater reasonableness and um, a better understanding of reality in terms of what is in the realm of the possible. Will that migrate to other areas of Iranian foreign policy? Well, I think we'll, we'll see, but I don't think uh, this is going to lead to a light switch, then all of a sudden the Iranians are going to become passive, docile in the region. No, we see what they're doing in places like Iraq and Syria, Yemen, other areas. This is something we have to continue to uh, be very mindful of. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me switch you to, again, one of the problems with the director of CAA is every minute somebody comes with another topic, but... The, the, like you. The, like me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, if we try to think about what President Bush called the war on terror, or what we now call, I guess, the struggle against violent Islamic extremism, or whatever the, the name of it is. So ISIS, and Al-Qaeda, and uh, Al-Nusra, and the Khoristan group. Uh, uh, if I try to think about this list, uh, uh, there seem to be more of them than there were when we started. So now that I remember, Rumsfeld had a wonderful snowflake at one stage in, uh, these were these memos he would send out in the middle of uh, the attack on Iraq or a couple of years into it. And he sent out the note to Wolfowitz and he said, are we creating more of these bastards than we're killing? Because it seemed like every time we would kill some, there would be three, okay? Uh, so if I look at the, at the, at the state of the, of the effort against uh, 
Al-Qaeda and its uh, associates or affiliates or branches or this or, or, or things that are even similar uh, and compare it with 9-11. So on the one hand, and I give thanks every day, there's not been another 9-11 here. So that's not by accident. Uh, but on the other hand, when I read about how many there are now, there's how many people who wish us ill and who think about that often, there seem to be more of them. So how are we doing? Well, it's hard to say what the region would be like if certain things didn't happen. One can make an argument that if we didn't go into Iraq, we wouldn't be facing the same type of issues in Iraq and, and Daesh and the terrorist phenomena that are there. Those are policy decisions, and they certainly affect the course of events, but they're hypotheticals as far as what the world would be like now. But if I look across the board in terms of since 9-11 and terrorist organizations, and if the United States in all of its various forms, in intelligence, military, homeland security, law enforcement, diplomacy, if we were not as engaged against the terrorists, I think we'd be facing a horrendous, horrendous environment right now because they would have taken full advantage of the opportunities that they've had throughout the region. Safe havens, areas where they are able to apply their trade, train operatives, gain materials. Uh, and we have worked collectively as a government, but also with our international partners, very hard to try to root many of them out. Uh, might some of these actions be stimulants to others joining their ranks? Sure, it's a possibility. I think, though, it has taken off of the battlefield a lot more terrorists than it has put on. Now, this is something that continues to ebb and flow in terms of some of the conditions in countries that we see the Arab Spring has had a major impact in the region. Al-Qaeda and the various uh, terrorist organizations were not responsible at all for that, but they took full advantage of the um, instability and the uncertainty and the lack of governance in many areas. And we see what's going on right now in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, yeah. in Yemen, uh, Egypt, other areas. Uh, and so these are organizations now. It's not just organizations. Al-Qaeda, the core, has certainly been decimated to a large extent where it was in the Afghan Pak region. That, they have very difficult time now using that as a launching pad to carry out a strategic attack against the United States. Uh, and working with partners, I think we've been very, very effective collectively as a U.S. government in that area. Dash. ISIL. I refer to it as Dash because it sounds more pejorative, and they certainly deserve as much pejorative terms as possible. Uh, that's more of a phenomenon that uh, it certainly is an organization that started in Iraq and split from the larger Al Qaeda in Iraq and Syria, but its roots are there and it spreads quickly over to, to Syria. But it is something that has, with the so-called establishment of a caliphate, has been able to attract a lot of people there, but also it has infected the minds of a lot of people in a much more uh, invasive and insidious way than I have found other terrorist organizations. Uh, and so this now is related or uh, creating all these metastases uh, cr cropping up and, and established organizations like Boko Haram in Nigeria adjoining it but also it's just incubating on its own in a number of other areas because they believe that it has demonstrated this great military might. And they've been very, very sophisticated as far as their use of social media and presenting this romanticized version of what's going on in the region that really is separate from reality. Uh, so I, recently, uh, there have been some real setbacks for ISIL. We see most recently at Tikrit. Yep. Uh, they've been pushed out of it. Kobani, Ain al Arab in the northern part of Syria, they were denied that after many months of fighting. Uh, so this phenomenon, I think, is going to continue to be a problem and crop up. Uh, and this, these organizations are uh, challenging the governments out there in ways that these governments are unable to uh, address. Both from an institutional standpoint, they don't have the security, intelligence, military capabilities, they don't have the institutions to address uh, some of the, uh, the political and social and economic problems that are there. So I don't see this phenomenon of terrorism that's springing out in these various communities um, coming down within the next year or two. I think it's going to continue to rise. So maybe if just one follow-up on that. So then do, 
because uh, I mean I I watch this from a distance and then I think do I understand what are what are the drivers of this ex seeming expansion in lots of different places and in lots of different varieties so to, if you try to think of it in disease terms there seem to be diseases breaking out in different places and they're they kill people, so uh, they're diseases, and they seem to be contagious, but they don't all to seem to be the same disease, and then they seem to be getting worse rather than better. I mean, that's where I was going back to the, there seem to be more of them in more places than there were before. So the, the question of whether what we're now doing, if we keep doing it, is gonna make it substantially different or or I mean, how I'm sure you I mean, you and I've talked about this before. Uh, if you ask me for sure, dead terrorists don't repeat. So that sounds good to me. Okay, so all the guys take it off the field. I'm for those. Okay, but if I look and say, are there more now than there used to be? There seem to be more. So is there something else I'm not doing? Or I mean, how are you thinking about that? <clears throat> well, I think. As you point out, there are a lot of factors that drive this phenomenon in the, in the Middle East. Increasingly, you have a very sectarian nature to it as well, because we see that one of the distinctions between Daesh and Al-Qaeda, Daesh has had a very strong anti-Shia engine to it. Because of the situation in both Iraq and Syria, the government of Baghdad for many years after you know, our troops went there, uh, it really failed to address the needs of the, of the communities there. And it was seen as a, as a Shia government, and it really alienated the Sunni community, which allowed Al-Qaeda in Iraq then to thrive and become Daesh. The same thing is true in a number of other countries, that this sectarian conflict is, is fueling the forces of instability and terrorism. It's also the lack of, of governance capacity. And we see that central governments, whether they be in Sana'a or Tripoli, Damascus, Baghdad, uh, other areas, they just don't have the capability to push back against these various groups. And unfortunately, violence has become a way of life in some of these societies and cultures, that their option to push back against the government is to join one of these radical organizations. Because there are no, very few, um, political organizations that don't have this purported religious base to them. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, you had Nasserism and Baathism and Communism and all of the various socialisms that were out there. You don't have that anymore. So the natural gravitational pull for people who are alienated with the lack of good governance, the lack of getting food and, and jobs, is to go to one of these groups that have as their raison d'etre opposition to the central government. Um, and so I think there's just, a, a, the, what was spurred by the Arab Spring really unleashed a lot of the pent up problems that were there, tensions, and this, these terrorist organizations have taken advantage of it. Our counterterrorism effort, the US government, is really designed to provide some time and space. There's no way that we can kill our way out of this challenge. We need to be able to stop those plots, those activities that threaten us, as well as our partners, and try to bring it down so that some of the political processes that really need to take root can. That is going to be a long and challenging uh, road. And when I look at Syria, the destruction of one of the you know, most beautiful countries in the world in terms of all the antiquities and sort of ancient cities that are there, it's just, it is a, a travesty. And can these countries be put back together uh, and have central governments that are going to rule over these multi-ethnic, multi-sectarian societies uh, without the force of an authoritarian uh, hand? It, it's it's an open question. Uh, so, again, another reason not to envy the director's job, uh, uh, though I agree with you, it's a great job. But uh, if we try to just think about, I mean, here in Boston, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing was a very big deal uh, psychologically for us, even though only three people died and 300 people were severely in injured. And it was a horrible, horrible, horrible event. But relative to what you think about every day, it's just a, you know, but, but still it's in Boston, so we think, think hard about it. We try to think about uh, here, 13 years after 9-11, attacks on the homeland. 
So as I said before, I give thanks for the fact that there haven't been additional mega attacks. Some of them would kill a hundred people or a thousand people. And if we try to think about that, the risk of that, there was a Gallup poll just recently that said, uh, showed that Americans are more worried about another major terrorist attack now than at any time since 9-11. But then I read the, uh, the 2015 uh, worldwide threat assessment by the director of national intelligence, the 2015 version, and there's no mention of a major terrorist attack on the U.S. So we should not be worried about that or we should be worried? Well, I think we in the intelligence community, law enforcement, homeland security community, always need to be worried about it. When I think about this country's um, vulnerability in uh, 2001 and 9-11, they were significant. This country has done a great job trying to identify those vulnerabilities and then preventing terrorists from taking advantage of it. It's much more difficult now to carry out a major attack here in the United States than it was 13 years ago. That said, a lot of terrorist groups are still being very, very uh, creative in the ways that they fabricate IEDs. There still seems to be a fixation with going after aviation targets. Their concealment methods are demonstrate tremendous expertise and capability. So we have to be on the top of our game every day. And that's where there's an architecture of intelligence, law enforcement, homeland security. Uh, you know, TSA, they do a great job. Uh, so it, it's a layered security um, system. Uh, I think Americans, as they see the horrific um, attacks, beheadings and other things overseas, I think they worry about that in terms of migrating to our shores. It's something we have to be concerned about, particularly since a lot of terrorist organizations take full use of the opportunities within the internet to recruit, to train, to direct, to uh, take full advantage of the openness of our society. And also, looking at the Boston bombings, it shows what just a couple of people can do. And there's a lot of things that are out there in, in various publications, Inspire from AQAP, Davik from Dash, that will show people how to actually fabricate weapons, IEDs. And there's such encouragement and incitement. So I think Americans have certainly a, a reasonable concern and fear. Uh, but I do believe that this government working with others is better prepared today than we were yesterday and the day before. But this is something that we cannot relax our guard in. Unfortunately, I think after 13 and a half years, some people tend to forget the devastation and the feeling of looking at those ashes of the Twin Towers. And we can get into you know, a conversation about the appropriate measures that we should take to prevent that again, and that's a very legitimate debate. But the bad guys are still out there. They still want to, to hit us. Uh, they are preoccupied now in certain areas with their local agendas, but that doesn't mean that they're not trying to kill Americans over there as well as here. So you get up every day or wake up every night thinking this could be another day, yeah? I think it's another day to, to prevent that type of recurrence, any type of attack. Uh, there are things that we worry about on a regular basis. Let me ask one more question and then we're gonna go to the audience. So. Uh, Again, one of the amazing things you've done at the, as director is decide, I don't have enough to do. I think I'm going to reorganize, uh, have a substantial reorganization or called modernization at the CIA. Uh, uh, when I first heard that, I thought, oh my goodness, uh, since I know many people there, they think, leave us alone, we're fine, uh, whatever. So uh, helping public understand what means what you're trying to do is difficult because reorganization or modernization, you need to know a lot of details. But if, if you're successful when you walk out the door in January of 2017, what's going to be different at CIA? Well, the purpose behind this modernization effort is that the agency has done some spectacular things throughout its 68-year history, have amazing successes. Um, but the world has changed in those 68 years. And a lot of parts of the agency have grown up at different times and in different ways. And I was away from the agency for about seven years or so. And I was able to see the agency from the outside. And when I was down at the White House for four years as assistant to the president, I was sometimes frustrated that the agency was not even more engaged in things because I knew about the tremendous capabilities and expertise that it had. 
And so the purpose behind this modernization effort is to make sure that CIA officers understand all of the arrows in our quiver, all of the things that we can do that will be able to address our national security challenges. And different parts of the agency sometimes were separated from one another and compartmented, and people didn't have a full appreciation of some of the capabilities that they could leverage in order to advance our capabilities, whether it be on the analytics side, operations side, covert action, or whatever. This is an effort to try to take full appreciation of the great capabilities that exist and bring them in into a system that people will be able to leverage open source, uh, leverage different types of, of digital uh, capabilities, bringing that to bear in a more integrated fashion. And uh, I, th I think this is just part of the natural evolution of an intelligence organization. And I think when I look at the US government overall, most of our departments and agencies were set up in the 20th century to deal with 20th century problems as well as 20th century technologies. If you look out over the last 10, 20 years, there's been an amazing revolution in terms of communication systems, interaction on the, on the technological front, and we need to take stock that the world's environment has changed. One of the things that we're doing at the agency is, for the first time in 50 years, is setting up a new directorate called the Directorate of Digital Innovation, because that digital environment is the environment where most human transactions and interactions are taking place these days. Financial, communication, social, trade, educational. That has tremendous implications, it has risks, but it has tremendous implications and opportunities for intelligence, for national security. We need to make sure that we understand all of the implications of that digital domain. So this is one of the things that I think that the agency, as well as others, need to take stock of, that the challenges of 2015 and 2020 and 2030 are much different than the ones this country faced in 1970 and 80. Because of technological change, the operating environment is much different, and we need to be able to adapt and be agile enough to be able to respond to it. And sometimes organizational structures will be limiting and stifling, and I don't want it to be that. I want it to allow the agility of the agency so that we can tap into those capabilities that we have in, the, in an optimal fashion. And that's what I'm trying to do. Since the world is such a big place, we have so many challenges, we need to make sure that we're getting every single bit of contribution out of every single dollar, resource, as well as person. Okay, well it's a huge undertaking and the building is still rumbling about it, we'll see. So we're, the microphones are here on the ground floor, please line up, and on the loges. Introduce yourself, and a good question is short and ends with a question mark. Let's start with this gentleman. Good evening, sir. My name is Matt Kennedy. I'm one of the National Security Fellows here at the Kennedy School, as well as a U.S. Army officer. And in light of the vast array of threats posed against our nation, what do you view, view as the greatest threat to the United States' vital interests, and why? Uh, <clears throat> I do think we still have to get a better sense of the digital environment, the cyber environment, because it fundamentally affects every aspect of our life. And when we go to the internet of things, we're all gonna be sort of interconnected with that. And it obviously has rich, rich opportunity. But I do think also it is the area that havoc and great devastation could be wrought by those that are seeking to do that. And it's not just the nation states that we have to worry about because you know, whether we're talking about the Chinas or the Russias or others, they have a stake in sort of the international economy, making sure the international financial system is going to keep going unless we're at war. But there are people who are out there that just want to do something disruptive because they can, where they're challenging themselves to do it. So uh, there is great potential for harm to come to this country. And uh, a lot of folks can take advantage of that to include terrorists and, and others that just want to you know, create mayhem. Gentlemen in the loge. Director Brennan, thank you very much for being with us tonight. My name is Tim Sandoli and I'm a research assistant at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And my question relates to Russia. NATO members Estonia and Latvia host significant ethnic Russian and Russian speaking populations what many analysts see as a ripe target for Putin's irredentist ambitions. Yeah. They are concerned about Putin's hybrid war in Ukraine and worried that a more sophisticated iteration of such warfare could be executed on Baltic territory without triggering Article 5. 
Is the alliance prepared to deal with the possibility of hybrid war on one of its uh, member states? And to the extent that you can disclose such information in a public forum, what capabilities is the US intelligence community providing NATO to counter such warfare? Thank you. Well, the first part of your question I leave to policymakers whether or not NATO is willing to sort of use Article 5 uh, and what are the thresholds that need to be sort of passed to trigger such a uh, reaction. Clearly, what's happened in Ukraine is something that the world has taken great notice of. And this tension, I think, is not going to be limited to Ukraine, obviously. We've already seen it with Georgia. We've seen it with other areas. You point out the Baltics. Uh, Mr. Putin has his own view of what the Russian motherland should look like and what the near abroad should look like. And I think he views this area between the East and the West, in Eastern Europe and in Western sort of Russian uh, area, as a, a place of, of tension and almost zero, zero sum gamemanship there. That I think he sees the West as encroaching into areas of traditional Russian sort of oversight and is going to be pushing back in a very aggressive way, which he's done in Ukraine. The Baltics obviously have great concern because, as you point out, there are some Russian populations there, but not just the Baltics and other areas of Eastern Europe. Uh, we in the intelligence community need to be as um, informed as possible about what the Russians and others are doing. Uh, clearly, there is various dimensions of Russian assertiveness and aggressiveness. Some is the intelligence vanguard that will precede any type of more overt moves in terms of supporting various elements within a country or even providing some type of military support. We need to be working very closely, and we are working very closely with our partners, and the Russians know that we are. Um, and what I see with the Russians is that the closer you get to that Russian motherland, the more sensitive, hyperactive, and even emotional they are on it. The further away you go from that, I think there are ways to deal with the Russians in a more pragmatic way, in a more reasonable way. But this area of uh, Eastern Europe and Ukraine, I think Mr. Putin still has to figure out what is his exit ramp on it. I think as the sanctions continue to bite and it's going to hurt, uh, he, I think, knows that over the longer term, there needs to be some type of relief. Otherwise, he's going to face some serious uh, challenges. And I don't think he's thought through yet the, uh, the appropriate exit ramp that allows him to save face, but also recognizes that he's not going to win this, uh, in this game. Gentlemen in the lunch. Uh, thank you, Director Brendan. My name is William Den. I'm an Army officer and a second-year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, last year, the New York Times reported about a CIA review where we analyzed uh, the effectiveness of past interventions where we were training uh, and arming uh, rebels uh, overseas. And ultimately, the conclusion was that it was not that effective. I'm curious, as you're thinking about the Middle East in general, uh, or specifically Syria, what are the conditions that you're looking for uh, when you're thinking about the factors needed to be successful, ultimately, in an intervention where we are uh, arming and training rebel forces? Well, first of all, you have to have a, a constituency that is receptive to that. Uh, you also have to have a group of individuals where your interests are at least uh, mostly aligned with theirs. Uh, to me, you, we should not and we do not support elements that are contrary to our interests, to our ideals, and our objectives. Uh, as you know, the Department of Defense is moving forward with the train equip program for Syrian opposition. That is very surgically focused on those elements of the opposition that are not of the extremist persuasion. Um, you point out the study that was done. It shows that insurgencies do take a long time to prevail, as well as it takes a long time for governments to prevail over insurgencies. And I don't think anybody thinks that these efforts uh, are short-lived. Sometimes, especially here in the United States, with election cycles, uh, sometimes people look at things with impatience. You know, why haven't we done this already? We are the United States. Well, what you don't want to do is to force a solution on the parties here. You want to try to support those that you want to come out ascendant. Uh, and this is something that I think has to be done very, very carefully. Uh, and you know, one can make an argument that you know, we should engage sooner rather than later and not be as discriminating in terms of who it is that you provide support to. Uh, a lot of debates on these issues. But I think what we have to do first and foremost is find groups that we feel that we could live with and would support 
uh, if they were able to prevail and uh, you know, be victorious. This gentleman. Hello, my name is Patrick. Um, thanks so much for coming to the forum and sharing your insights. Uh, in regards to foreign policy, what is a strategic decision the US will have to make over the next 10 years that will be remembered 100 years from now? And then on a more personal level, what's been a strategic principle of yours that served you well in your career and personal life? Oh, <laughs> strategic decision we're going to make in the next 10 years. I, I think I would go back again to the, the cyber area because there are fundamental um, amendments that need to be made, I think, to law and policy and uh, capabilities within the U.S. government and the relationship between the public sector and the private sector because the cyber environment is not one that we own and, and, and it's going to be an international arrangement as well. So I think... Either we're going to make good decisions and take good actions that will be remembered for 100 years, or we're not going to, and the calamities that will ensue will be remembered for 100 years as well. Strategic decisions or principles. Uh, one is being as honest and straightforward as possible. And for me, being in mostly in the intelligence world throughout the course of my career, I was a policy maker for those four years of the White House, but I was neither a Democrat nor Republican, never have been registered one way or the other. I assiduously try to steer clear of political positions and uh, giving a sense that I am advocating for a policy. Because if I do that, then it really raises questions about the objectivity and integrity of the intelligence that I'm providing. Because one could say even I'm unwittingly skewing it as a way to support that policy position. It's, it's sometimes it's challenging, and when I'm in the White House sit room and it goes around the table, I have to point out what the intelligence considerations are or implications. But to be an intelligence officer, to be an intelligence professional, you really need to be quite mindful of what your role is and in informing the policymakers about what the uh, results or implications, consequences are of their actions. So we have lots of uh, questioners, and we don't have too much time. And I'm going to apologize, but David Sanger, who's the New York Times uh, Washington correspondent is in line. And since this is on the record, we'll let David ask a question. Then we're going to this gentleman. Go I was ahead. hoping we didn't have time for David. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. I'll try to be very brief so that we can uh, get questions uh, from others. Um, back to what uh, Graham was asking you about on Iran. President Obama said over the weekend that he had asked for some intelligence about Ayatollah Khamenei, what his thinking was about the agreement, what his overall objectives are here. And when he was asked, how did that turn out? He said, well, not terribly satisfactory. I'm not sure we really learned a huge amount. Can you tell us a little bit about that, how you analyze why the Ayatollah, who sent so many angry letters back to the president when he first reached out to him, what, six years ago now, may have made a, a shift in decision? What do you think changed it? Was it the sanctions? Was it sabotage against his uh, nuclear system? Was it fear of restiveness within Iran? I think it's all of the above, quite frankly, because six years ago, we were in a much different situation. First of all, we had a president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, who you know, was quite irrational and not somebody that anybody could deal with. Secondly, we didn't have the sanctions at the time, and so Iran was trying to ride out sort of a lot of the international opprobrium about sort of their activities. But over the course of the last six years, sanctions really have, have hit. You have a president, Rouhani, who I think is, as I said, much more reasonable. He was educated in the West, in Scotland, and he has a history of engaging with the West, and he is a much more practical and reasonable individual. And Khamenei allowed him to run for president, and I think people were surprised that Rouhani won. But I think also Khamenei was in the position of being able to say to Rouhani and Zarif, OK, see if you can get a deal. Because if you do, Khamenei is going to be able to derive the benefits from it in terms of what might ensue. And if you don't get one, he has Rouhani and Zarif to blame. So I think over time, and Rouhani was able to explain to Khamenei just how challenging the economic environment is right now in Iran, and it was destined to continue to go down. And the only way they were going to address the grievances inside the country were to get relief on sanctions. They didn't have control over the oil market and where those prices were going, but they did have the ability to get those sanctions removed if they came to terms with the deal. And again, when I look at the concessions that they made, 
going from 19,000 centrif nearly 19,000 centrifuges to six, a little over 6,000, only 5,000 or so operating, boy, nobody, nobody ever thought that they would do that at the beginning. And I think it demonstrated their interest in having it. Now, again, one might argue that they want that relief not just to take care of the butter and the bread that they need to distribute, but they also want to be able to flex their muscles regionally in terms of what they need to do in Iraq and Syria, Yemen and other places. But I do think it's it, the economic uh, situation in Iran, as well as the change in the leadership, as well as Khamenei's willingness to give Rouhani the leash, contributed to where we are today. And did any of the U.S. efforts to slow their program contribute to it, you think, other than the sanctions? I think their inability to progress uh, certainly helped slow that program. I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute your reporting to helping that. Exactly. Quite <laughs> frankly, and, I, I, and I despite agree. your reporting, we're able to make progress on this front. Good, good. This gentleman. Yeah. Uh, good, good evening, sir. My name is Joe Sacron, uh, and I'm a trauma surgeon and a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my question is in regards to the often one-sided public narrative uh, in which the agency is viewed. I realize for a variety of obvious reasons that often the sacrifice of officers of the agency goes unrecognized. But I also realize the importance that the officers provide in maintaining the strength and security of our nation. So as director of the CIA, I'm just curious as to your thoughts and perhaps action plans that you have in place to quell this often one-sided public narrative that frankly is very difficult to swallow and often happens on the backs of so many men and women that are trying to provide, provide security for our republic. Well, thank you. I think the agency over the past 68 years has really been instrumental in keeping this country safe, as you say. And it's been on the, the sweat and sometimes the blood of agency officers who have sacrificed greatly for this country. And unfortunately, um, there too often there is the perspective that the agency is you know, a rogue organization and does all these illegal, unlawful things, immoral things. We have made mistakes over the years, without doubt. But we, the CIA, also have been asked to do some of the most challenging and difficult things that this country has ever asked of its people, its citizens. And we have an obligation as an organization to follow duly authorized chain of command. If something is deemed to be lawful and if something is directed to the agency by the president, well, we need to salute and do, the, do it the best we can. Now, those mistakes that we made, we've learned from. Unfortunately, I think sometimes there are political agendas at play that have a certain perspective as well as a certain ideological uh, position that cast things in a very, very negative light. And we've tried to speak publicly about it. And I spoke publicly after the Senate report on detention and interrogation program that was issued, 500 some odd pages. We agreed with some things in that report and we disagreed vehemently with other things. We felt as though it was not a fair representation of the agency's program because over the course of that program, what the agency did on counterterrorism, I believe, and I know I'm not the most objective person in the world in this, but I was out of the agency for much of that time. The agency, more than any other department or agency, was instrumental in finding those terrorists and bringing them to justice and stopping their, their activities. So I think the agency has a lot to be proud of that's why I am proud every day of leading this organization. Will we make mistakes in the future? Probably. We'll need to learn from them. We need to put in place the procedures and policies that will try to minimize that. But the agency is a wonderful organization that every American should be proud of. And like you, I am frustrated that there is the, the reputation of the agency that is out there that frequently does not comport with reality. Gentlemen in the lodge. My name is Vince. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Western citizens who have gone to Syria and Iraq to fight for ISIS. I was wondering uh, how big of a threat do you think those citizens are and what your plan is to deal with them once they return? Well, I'm going to be relying heavily on FBI and DHS when they return here. Uh, there probably are close to 200 or so Americans who have tried to either go to Syria and Iraq or have made it there. Some have been killed there. Uh, this is something we're working very closely with uh, our international partners, both in the Middle East, Europe, Southeast Asia, other areas, to share information about these individuals. We are tracking some of their, their routes that they go into uh, the theater. 
so we are concerned because they tend to become even more radicalized, and a lot of these foreign fighters gravitate not toward the more moderate elements of, let's say, the Syrian opposition. They gravitate toward the Daeshes, the Nusras, the Khorasan groups, and others. Uh, and so they then also have a, a tremendous suicidal tendency. And a lot of them go there just to be martyred. They want to be martyred there. Uh, it's the ones that may be returning with new skills, new capabilities, as well as with a, uh, an agenda to, uh, to kill here. That's, and the partnership between CIA, the intelligence community, and law enforcement, homeland security, and military is stronger than I've ever seen it before. Every day it has to get stronger, but it really has is, is come a remarkable way. This lady. Hi, um, my name is Theodora, and I'm a first year in the Master in Public Policy program here. Um, for those of us considering a career in public service at the federal level, I'd be curious to hear what sorts of decisions you've made that you feel have most furthered your career. If, if you can discuss them. Um, <laughs> during my career, I think before my career started, the decisions I made that were instrumental in getting me hired by the agency is that I studied in Cairo junior year, I went over there. Uh, I also went to Indonesia in the summer of my freshman year to do a tutorial on oil and politics in Indonesia. It gave me that foreign experience. It, it opened up sort of new vistas for me. It made me more attractive to the agency to be hired. During the course of my career, I, I had a very checkered career, bounced around the agency. I, I did not want to follow a conveyor belt uh, in terms of going along only one track. I would go after some of the jobs that other people didn't want because I felt as though it was going to be enriching of my experience as an intelligence officer. Because I really felt that the broader experience I had, the more I understood how my specialty or expertise fit within the broader agency. And as people go up in an organization, you need to have that breadth of experience and exposure because it gives you the tools. And one of the things we're trying to do within the agency is give our officers more of an opportunity to experience what life is like outside of their component or even the agency. I always speak to the uh, military's capstone and pinnacle uh, classes. This is the one star and three star flag officers. And I go through all their resumes and I find it just so invigorating when I look at the experience they've had in their 20, 22 year career. They were able to go off to schools and, and have these learning opportunities. That's critically important as far as leadership is concerned because you cannot stay in that individual stovepipe and then go up the ladder and all of a sudden be expected to have a breadth of responsibility, both substantively and organizationally, if you haven't had that experience and exposure. And so, again, going after some of those less sought after opportunities, not worrying about if I'm gonna get promoted in six months or 12 months. I have found that my career was able to happen to me. This gentleman, please. Sir, thank you so much for coming to the Kennedy School. My name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I'm an MPS student here at the Kennedy School. My question is concerning the drone strikes in the FPAC region. There has been a significant decline in the number of drone strikes that have been taking place in that region. What's the reason? Is it because the CIA does not want to depend on the drone strikes, or you think the war on terror in that front is almost over? Thank you. Well, I'm not going to um, address what the CIA may or may not do with those things that you call drones. Uh, <laughs> what I will say is that in that area, the AFPAC region, there has been tremendous progress made to decimate a lot of those Al-Qaeda elements, and it's because of very good partnership with our Afghan partners and with our Pakistani partners as well. And it's not just CIA, it's a lot of engagement on the diplomatic front and the military front. And I also find that, particularly over the last six months or so, eight months since uh, we have now President Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan, the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan is improving, and that's critically important because that border region there where the Haqqanis traverse and a number of the other militant groups, that's the area that is the incubator for a lot of these terrorists, not just in the region that threaten our folks in Kabul or Islamabad, but also, again, the launching pad outside. So I think it reflects a lot of progress uh, that has been made in that area, and also there's been, as you well know, a drawdown of U.S. military forces in Afghanistan, so that means there's reduced capacity, capability, as far as uh, what it, we have to, to bring against the terrorist target. Lady in the front. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dina Shiroki, and I am a graduating Master's in Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School, and most importantly, a student of Professor Allison's. Um, I was honored. <laughs> my question relates directly to Daesh. Um, the United States administration seems pretty intent on not putting American troops on the ground. 
but that would seem to suggest that we will need to rely heavily on the Revolutionary Guard to do the dirty work. However, we clearly don't want the perception that we're giving Iran, Iraq simply to Iran. So my question is, how does the United States balance the desire to mitigate Iran's hegemonic ambitions, but also keep in with our strategic objective to roll back ISIS, Daesh, in Iraq and Syria? Well, I wouldn't say at all that we're ceding the ground to the IRGC and the Iranians in Iraq. In fact, we are providing a fair amount of support and training and equipping the Iraqi security forces that have to be, in large respects, reconstituted because they really did collapse as Daesh came down from the, the north. There also are a number of Shia militia that are working in concert with the Iraqi security forces. And I'm talking about sort of the, the good end of the Shia militia spectrum as opposed to the Qatab, Hezbollah, and AH and other elements there. Uh, and so I think what we need to do is to work with the Abadi government in Baghdad, providing support to those elements of the Iraqi security structure, continue to support them. But th there is some obvious alignment between our interests and Iranian interests in Iraq, which is to try to roll back Daesh. Does that mean that we're working cheek to jowl with them? No, it doesn't. You know, there are parts of the battlefield that they work on and there are things that we do in Iraq. Uh, but we're not going to say to Iran, okay, you can have your way, because obviously Iran has a number of ambitions, uh, hegemonic as you say. Uh, there also is the concern that they could be fueling some elements of the Quds Force, Qasem Soleimani and others, that might be fueling some of the, the sectarian aspects of this conflict, which is we don't want to do. It has to be an effort by the Sunni and the Shia communities in Iraq pushing back collectively against Daesh. That's gonna take some time, but we're not ceding the ground to Iran by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, we have about four minutes left, so we need short questions and short answers, and this lady's next. Hi, my name's Sally Marsh, and I'm a freshman in the college. Um, I'm wondering, what is your response to the idea that our counterterrorism efforts um, are inadvertently increasing anti-American sentiments in the Middle East and around the world? Um, especially as a result of tactics like drone strikes that affect civilians? Well, I think uh, as we pursue our counterterrorism strategy, as we work with the governments, first of all, it's very important that we're able to work with them so it's not seen as an intervening force from outside. We have to be mindful of the need to balance the uh, CT efforts and not just sort of roll over areas. We're, we, the U.S. government, the U.S. military, uh, are very, very careful about taking action that's going to um, have collateral civilian impact. A lot of these stories that you, you hear about in terms of, oh my goodness, there are hundreds of civilians that are killed, whatever, a lot of that is propaganda that is put out by those elements that are very much opposed to the U.S. coming in and helping. Uh, Yemen is a great example. President Hadi, who was just sort of pushed out of Yemen, was looking for and working and acknowledged publicly about the U.S.-Yemeni joint counterterrorism operations against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. We need to have partners like that, but there are gonna be some elements that are out there that just are inherently anti-U.S. and will use whatever opportunity they do to push against us. This gentleman, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Pradeep. I'm a freshman from college. The Patriot Act is coming to an end on June the 1st. Uh, and if it doesn't get renewed, what might it mean for CIA and its programs? Well, I think the, the Patriot affects other organizations more than it affects us, although the information that's derived certainly helps us understand the, the, the threat picture. But I do think the um, information that is derived from FISA uh, is critically important. And I know that the Congress is looking at the Patriot Act and we're hoping that this is gonna be able to go through. Obviously, there have been some adjustments in uh, statutory language and, and policy perspectives, but to me, the Patriot Act is something that is important to, uh, to continue. Okay, I'm afraid that we're coming to the end, but let me take this gentleman's question and this gentleman, so ask them together, and then we'll let John answer both of them together, so please. Director Brennan, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm a joint degree master's candidate with the business school uh, in the Kennedy School uh, and also former military officer. Uh, my question is involving uh, change leadership and an organizational change. Uh, Professor Allison asked or, or discussed the, uh, the restructuring that the, the agency is going through. Um, and across the river, we talk a lot about organizations that are, are large and have struggles uh, with their processes, their values, kind of the people and the culture that, that uh, is created over the, over the years. And I'm curious 
from your perspective, have you seen those, some of those challenges, or what are those challenges? And then also, as the leader of the organization, kind of helping to steer the ship, if you could talk us through uh, you know, what you've done to impact the change. Thank you. And we'll take this question. It'll be the last one, please. Yeah. My name is Julian. I'm a freshman at the college. And my question is, so we've been fighting the war on terror since 2001. Is there an end in sight, or should we just get used to this new state of existence? Hmm. There are less smart students here at Harvard, I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> and it's surprising, because all these are the students who couldn't get into Fordham, I guess. Well, in, in, <laughs> in, in, in spite of the professors, we do our best. To, so when they get, by the time they leave, they will be less smart. Yes. <laughs> the organizational issue, particularly as it affects the US government, is something that we could talk about all day. And hopefully, there's a course somewhere in Harvard that is looking at this from what we need to do in the national security environment to adapt some of the practices and, and policies we have. But just looking at individual organizations, um, that's what's behind sort of our modernization effort here, because I do think that we need to change and adapt. I had the great opportunity several years ago to help start up what has become the National Counterterrorism Center. I was able to take a blank slate and say, OK, for an organization, what features does it need to be self-sustaining? But also, I recognized pretty early on that I couldn't just design something that was going to be an island to itself. It needs to be able to empower and be empowered by the outside environment. And so one of the real challenges for organizations in the government is that there needs to be a system of systems, and the systems re-engineering is really daunting, that makes the pieces interoperable in an optimal fashion. And so as we go through our organizational change in CIA, I am very mindful that I'm not doing it just for ourselves, because we're nobody if we're not able to interact effectively with FBI and Homeland Security and military and the NSC and others. So it has to be designed in a way that makes, gives some organizational coherence to CIA, but then recognizes that we need to empower and be empowered by the rest of the environment. I only have control over CIA. And so what I need to do is be thinking about what we need to do to be a more effective organization. But at the same time, our effectiveness is only going to be realized if we're able to interact effectively with the outside. And I do think a lot of the organizational structures, practices of 20th century US government need to be revised and updated. And that systems engineering challenge that is evident within the United States government, it's not just the US government. A lot of governments right now are dealing with it because the technological changes. When I came in the agency, we didn't have personal computers. We didn't. We had typewriters and whiteout. People probably don't even know what whiteout is. It was really <laughs> valuable <laughs> back then. Uh, now we have all these capabilities, and it has made our business and our mission uh, much different than it was in the past. I was mentioning earlier today, when there was a coup in Africa in the 1970s or something, usually it was a CIA officer who was writing a cable that would get in to Washington about the coup. Now you have a CNN camera crew going down the road with the coup members. I mean, it's, so how does that change what it is that we do? Well, we have to change and adapt. And there's also so much information that is out there. So again, the challenges going forward are different than what it is that we did for the past 68 years, even the past 10 years. So on organizational issues, have to be thinking not just how the various pieces fit together and how you need to design the different portfolios. You need to be taking into account how the environment that you're operating in has changed and is likely to change more and more as you go forward. And that's why this digital environment is the environment that I think a lot of us are going to be operating within. So. Uh, that, that is a course that needs to be uh, at the undergraduate and graduate level. Your uh, next incarnation. Uh, yeah. Uh, and this is a question, is this is lo a long uh, war yeah. or, or forever? Yeah. It's, a, it's a long war, uh, unfortunately. And, but it's, it's been a war that has been in existence for millennia at the same time. The use of violence for political purposes against non combatants um, by either a state actor or a subnational group. Terrorism has taken many forms over the years. What is more challenging now is, again, the technology that's available to terrorists, the great devastation that be can be created by even a handful of folks, and also mass communication that just proliferates all of this activity and incitement and encouragement so you have an environment now that's very conducive to 
that type of uh, propaganda and uh, recruitment efforts, as well as the ability to get materials that are going to kill people. And so this is going to be something we're always going to, I think, have to be vigilant about. There is evil in the world, and some people just want to kill for the sake of killing. That's why when I look at the Dash people, I mean, it's just the, the horrendous nature of that violence. These are sociopaths. They're murderers. They're thugs. And that's why there's a big debate about, well, why don't we call it Islamic terrorism? They purport to be Muslims. They are not Muslims. They are murderers. Again, the, these are individuals that have no um, standing in the, in the world, and we shouldn't give them the credibility or the legitimacy associated with one of the world's religions. Uh, but this is something that, whether it's from this group right now or another group, I think the, uh, the ability to cause damage and violence and kill will be with us uh, for you know, many years to come. We just have to not kill our way out of this because that's not going to address it. We need to stop those attacks that are in train, but we also have to address some of these underlying factors and conditions. And I'm not saying that poverty causes somebody to become a terrorist or lack of governance, but they certainly do allow these terrorist organizations to grow. And they take full advantage of those opportunities. So I'm very sorry to bring this to a conclusion, but I must say it's a terrific honor for us to have the director here today. Let's say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.